All right, well, it is 12 o'clock and I would like to go ahead and get started so we can be uh, respectful of everybody's time and if anybody else joins in, that's perfectly fine. So thank you all for joining us. I see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, I'm Melody Blevins. I'm the project manager for Access ETSU. I'm also an adjunct instructor for the Ed Foundations and Special Ed Department, um, which is really how I started working for the university. And then I was really enticed by the Access ETSU opportunity. So I'm really excited to talk to you today about universal design for learning um, as a way to make uh, improve inclusive practices. This is something that I'm super passionate about. It's something I have been working with for many, many years. Um, originally came from the uh, K-12 world, and I spent a lot of time working with educators to improve their inclusive practices. Um, so it does naturally translate into higher ed. Uh, there's a lot of things I've learned with working with both undergraduate and graduate students, and I'm excited to share some um, things with you that I, some trial and error things that I have sorted out. And I'm always looking for ways that I can reevaluate my course and continue to make them as inclusive as possible. UDL is a really great way to do that. Um, I, unfortunately, on the other side of that, I feel like if I had a dollar for every time I said next semester, things will be, you know, much more settled. I've revamped this course so many times and, and we'll all have it all worked out next semester, but that's never the case because we're always looking to improve. So I don't know if anybody else resonates with that. That's how I feel. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today, we could spend 45 minutes talking about each one of these topics. Um, this is just an informal lunch and learn session. So I want to give you a broad overview so that you either walk away with a, a tidbit or two of knowledge or something that you might be more curious about to learn more about. Um, and we'll talk about some ways that you could do that as well. Uh, as part of it being an informal lunch and learn session, I am perfectly comfortable if you want to unmute and add any thoughts, ask any questions. I also have the chat up. And so you can throw some ideas and thoughts and questions in there as well. Um, so I like to do things very informally and have a good conversation. I also understand if, if you're busy and multitasking and hopefully having lunch because it is lunchtime. Mm -hmm. um, so if you'd like to talk anything that we come up with today, talk about today, if you want to talk about that in fur uh, further detail, I would love to talk to you about it because, again, it's a passion of mine. I also have Ann Pierce here with me today. She's our academic coordinator here at Access ETSU. So her main role is not only to provide academic support to our students that get services from us, but she's also here to support you all as faculty members or other faculty members that you might share this information with in your departments. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out anytime to either one of us. Um, both of us combined have quite a bit of experience. I won't say how much because we're still very young, but um, we have a lot of experience and uh, we would love to talk to you about uh, where to go from here, basically. So let's start with a, a basic overview of universal design for learning, also known as UDL. So starting with a very scientific uh, uh, representation here, which one of these cats do you identify with? So you can tell me in the chat if you're comfortable, but I do want you to just pause and reflect when you hear that term, universal design for learning, what cat do you resonate with? I know me personally, I am all of these cats uh, many times. So like I said, sometimes I feel like I've done all the revamping I can do with my course. And I'm like cat number three or maybe even cat number four. I'm perfectly content. I feel like I'm on top of this. And then uh, usually prompted by a student making me kind of rethink something or uh, think about something differently. I turn in quickly to cat number one and cat number two. I'm like, okay, this, this could be done differently. I might feel a little overwhelmed. Um, so the first thing I want us to do is to talk about some misconceptions related to universal design. This is a term that I feel like has gained a lot of traction, um, but what I want to talk about is that it is not one of the latest and greatest buzzwords. We know those of us who have been around doing things for a while in the education field, there's, there's trends that come and go, there's words that come and go. But universal design for learning is not one of those fly-by-night words that come and go. This is a term that was originally coined in the 80s, but really has trends even further back than that. Um, so this is definitely something that is um, has a lot of research behind it. It's something that is taking hold probably in current climates. A lot, I would say a lot of it is due to what we experienced with the pandemic. Um, universal design for learning is not something that's going to go away. 
In fact, it's quite the opposite. And we can see that here with the services that we offer here at ETSU. So when I was a student getting my master's degree many years ago, we did not have as many of these services or specialized departments or organizations that specialize in student support like we do now, which is fantastic. I think that's one thing that is a hallmark for um, ETSU and something that sets us apart is the way that we do come together and support the whole student. And that really has some basis with universal design. Um, it's not just something for people with disabilities, though it does support people with disabilities, and it was born out of a need to accommodate people with disabilities. But we can take those principles and we can apply it to all populations that will benefit. So throughout this conversation, you'll hear me use the word accessible, which I think sometimes we do kind of um, think about people with disabilities with that word. But I want to think about that word broadly as, for, as far as accessible to as many people as possible. The uh, next point is something I really want us to think about as we go on is UDL is not something that you do all or nothing. You're not either all in with UDL or all out. In fact, you probably have pieces and parts of it that you're already implementing in lots of different ways. And I would venture to guess that some of those ways you really didn't even know was a universal design. So we're gonna talk about those. What I would like to think, um, have us kind of wrap our minds around this afternoon is this image here. We want to move the needle with UDL. So uh, whatever you're doing now, we want to talk about ways you can continue to move that needle, needle towards more inclusive, more inclusive. Um, there's not really an end goal in mind. There's not, oh, oh good, you're 100% inclusive. Because like I said, a student will come along that will challenge that perception of how inclusive are my current practices. And again, like I said, this is not something new. This is not something that you're not already doing. You're definitely already doing this. Um, and your colleagues are already doing this. It's what we categorize or classify it as. And we're going to look at that today. All right, so we talked about what is it not. So let's look at what it is. So I'm going to focus on these three key uh, markers of UDL. We could take this in a couple different directions, but these are the three that I think in a 45 minute lunch and learn are the most important. So universal design for learning, it is a framework. It's not something that you do or don't do. It's not something that you, um, it's not a process. It's not a um, something that you have to buy into. It is a mindset and a framework that you can use to design learning for everybody from the beginning. And we're gonna talk about what that means, planning with the end goal in mind. So rather than making a plan for learning and then trying to fit certain populations in that plan or reworking certain parts of that plan to make it more accessible to them, we're going to start with the, the idea that we're going to try to cast a wide net, so to speak. We're going to make a plan that has a large scope to it so that we can reach as many people as possible from the get-go. And then, of course, we can make variations as needed uh, from there. But if we plan with a, a wide lens, then we don't have to make as many. In the middle here is the idea that the universal design is a plan for what we call learner variability. So if that's a term you're not familiar with, it comes from uh, Dr. Todd Rose, who talks about um, the idea that there is no such thing as an average person anymore. So many, many moons ago in education, you might have talked about an average student, an average test score, or an average on grade level reader, or an average socioeconomic status background, or in higher ed, you might talk about your average uh, typical undergraduate student learner. And now it's becoming more atypical to have that, so, so to speak, average learner. So it's becoming more the, uh, the rule rather than the exception that we have students that come in with what we call these jagged profiles. They've got strengths in certain areas, and they have some areas where they need some support, and everybody has that. So there's nobody that you meet on this campus, in this community, in this world that only has strengths. Everybody has something where they need some support. The, the challenge here could be helping our students understand their variability. Where do they personally have strengths? What are some areas where they need support? Some of our students are more aware than others. Um, so working through that with them is really important as well. Uh, looking at the last one, flexible pathways to learning. That could be both input, what you as the instructor are giving the student, as well as output what that student is able to show you. Uh, so being comfortable with 
uh, things being flexible. And this is something that sometimes personally I have a hard time with uh, because it can be really difficult to challenge your thinking in a different way and think, how can I make this more flexible? How can I make this more inclusive? Especially when you're giving students a couple different choices. Um, and, it's, and it's difficult to think, hmm, how do I make sure that we're doing this so that everybody has a similar experience with having those choices? So I'm going to pause here to just reiterate that as we're talking about um, implementing UDL within our practices, that sometimes it might feel a little uncomfortable. Sometimes it might feel a little challenging uh, because you're thinking about things in a different way. So you've had maybe a traditional path or a traditional way that you've done something. Um, and that it, it, eventually it might uh, kind of take hold. So that's why we're going to talk about moving the needle. I don't want you to feel like you have to take your course that you currently are working on right now and by fall implement it to be super, you know, completely inclusive in all aspects. I want you to think through this of one or two small ways that you can slowly move that needle uh, to take steps towards being a more universally designed practice. So another uh, aspect of UDL is the ways in which we can modify things, change things, uh, provide accessibility. Uh, so for example, uh, environments. In 2020, we all changed things quite a bit with our environment to make it more accessible. There's some good and some bad with that and that it carried over into now, you know, if you have a student that has a conflict with your class and says, I can't be there tonight, but maybe uh, could I join online? That's a way to make things more accessible. So we've made that environment more flexible for that student to be able to allow them to participate. Um, methods and materials are probably an area where you have the most options for making things more accessible. So in turn, that also means it can be the most overwhelming. So thinking about um, those of us with asynchronous courses that provide content online, uh, when we look for things, so you might have the student read the textbook, you also might have them visit an online module, perhaps watch a video. Those are all different methods of taking in information. Some of those might resonate with some students more than others. Um, some students might prefer certain um, aspects of, of those types of methods. And then in a, one of the slides later, we're going to talk about changing our language to be more universally designed and more inclusive as well when we talk about learner variability. So with those slides that I just went over, that is your super quick introduction to what UDL is. Um, when I send out these materials, I'll also include some links to some other resources if you really want to dive deeper into understanding universal design. But for the purpose of our informal time here, I just wanted to give you a brief overview because what I would like to do is spend more time talking about how we do this. So um, if you're interested in learning more about the why and the what, we can talk about that too. But uh, today we're really gonna focus on the how so that you can leave here with some ideas for getting started and implementing this as, as quickly as you would like to. So two ways to get started, we're gonna talk about mindset and starting with the end goal in mind. So this cartoon I think has made its rounds around the internet and social media several times with lots of different variations, but I chose this one because it does do a pretty good job at explaining uh, the differences between, uh, on the left side, we're familiar with that uh, image, the equality and equity. So we're in the first frame, everybody's getting everything. Nobody's taking into account that learner variability illustrated here by the uh, heights of the people in the picture. Everybody gets the same thing. So in the middle, we've taken a step towards inclusivity. That's great, we've, we've thought about individualization and thinking about meeting their needs, where we have some people in the picture getting a little bit more than others because that's the level of, of need that they express and they, they show. But on the end, the third pane there is what really illustrates universal design. So what if, instead of looking at the person in the picture, or in this case, our learner, what if instead of looking at them from a deficits-based perspective and think, um, what is it that they need and how can we make this more equitable? What if we remove to the barriers in the first place and just start from there? So this really illustrates what I was talking about a few slides back about starting with uh, the design that's going to reach the most individuals. We still have the feature of the fence, which in this case is protecting them from the baseball game. So we still have the same outcome, which is that safety, that protection, but it's done in a way that eliminates the need to have to uh, individualize or modify things for anybody in the picture because it's more universally designed. 
So when we're thinking about barriers, we're thinking about what is it within the, um, we're talking about what's within the, what, I'm sorry, what's not within the student's control when it comes to barriers. So we're talking about the environment. We're not talking about necessarily what's wrong, so to speak, with the student, but what can we improve in the environment to be able to make uh, this experience better for them? And that's where we start changing our inclusive language. So thinking about um, the student struggles with this, let's change that thinking a little bit more to what are the barriers to their learning. When you think about the student won't do this or they can't do this, there's usually some kind of barrier there that's creating some sort of tension or frustration that's preventing them from being able to accomplish whatever it is that you set out for them to accomplish. So with that in mind, because I'm trying to anticipate what how people may react to that, I give you a caution here. Um, and to, to just clarify that universal design is not about letting students get away with anything. It's not about being so flexible that you don't have boundaries or that there's no accountability or that there's no structure. In fact, I have found in my experience, it's actually quite the opposite. That when students understand that there is room for flexibility, whether or not they choose to use it, that, that I'm more invested in, in their understanding and their learning, they also are more invested in their understanding and their learning. So then we've kind of come together to create this buy-in that helps them uh, with greater accountability. So at the end of the day, when we've created these standards together, then they understand they've agreed to these terms. And if they don't meet them, the terms, then they realize that, hey, that's something I set out for myself. It's something I agreed to. And when they don't follow through at the end, then it leaves really very little room to talk about argument for the outcome. Uh, so when we're thinking about an inclusive UDL focused mindset, we know that there's a lot of factors that influence a student's success. And so we're thinking about ways we can remove those barriers to increase their accountability, which is just going to increase their success. I also mentioned the other way to get started besides mindset is your end goal. What is your end goal? What do you really want your students to be able to know? to understand, to be able to do. So if anybody has ever spent any time with a toddler, you know they spend a lot of time asking why, which can be great as long as you have enough sleep and you have enough patience to handle that. So I'm saying you should apply that mindset to your courses as well. Be that perpetual toddler that's asking why over and over and over again. Sometimes we just need to hear and understand that it's okay to reevaluate these things, that it's okay to look at something that we've done semester after semester after semester and go, why am I really asking students to do that? Is this really helping our student, my student understand uh, the outcome or the end goal of, of the course? So for example, this happened to me, I inherited a course and there was one pesky assignment that semester after semester, the students were struggling with. Um, I essentially had to uh, give them a significant amount of feedback in order to even get them to a place where they could feel comfortable submitting it. Um, it resulted in a lot of redoing and resubmitting the assignment, which is an inclusive practice and policy I'll discuss toward the end. Uh, so that kind of made me go, hmm. My students are clearly not experiencing success with this because they're struggling, they're, they're needing all this feedback, they're, they're just not being successful with doing this on their own. So we, I took a step back from the assignment and I thought, what is it I really want them to know and understand with this? And I was able to take what I want them to accomplish and those outcomes and embed them in other parts of the course that were less of a barrier and less cumbersome for my students. And so I decided to do that and cut the assignment out completely. It was really scary. The first semester that I didn't have that assignment, it was really scary. I remember asking at least two other colleagues, are you sure this is okay? This is an okay thing to do. So I'm here to tell you, yes, it's an okay thing to do. Try it. Sometimes we have a really hard time letting go of things that we've done for a long time simply because it was already there when we started or we've done it for so many semesters in a row. So here's your your green light to go ahead and, and try different things to be flexible because if you find that you uh, took it out and they actually need it, you can always put it back the next semester. One way you can get the information about whether or not your end goal aligns with what you need students to do 
is asking some of these questions to your students. That can be a little scary too, because students are generally very honest. <laughs> so I'm going to recommend that you look at these questions, you evaluate which ones might give you the most information that aligns with what you're looking for and something that you feel might help you improve your practice. Um, so you could uh, ask for students to give you this feedback in a couple of different ways. I've used um, the quizzes embedded in D2L uh, to ask for their feedback this way and give them like a completion grade for doing it. Uh, you could use Microsoft Forms. Google Forms are great to use as well. And I generally put some questions similar to this in like a mid-semester check-in. Uh, so I don't ask them at the end of every uh, unit or goal, or, or I'm sorry, unit or um, lesson. I don't ask them at the end of every class. I just choose one time to kind of take a temperature check, so to speak. Uh, if asking these questions is a little bit overwhelming to you, then I'm going to suggest you start with one course that you want to focus on or maybe even one of those questions that I just showed on that screen. Or maybe there's one particular lesson, module, unit, however you want to word it, that historically over and over and over, your students tend to struggle with. So I would zero in on one and start there. Um, because it, like we know, if you're collecting feedback, but it's too overwhelming to be able to use that feedback efficiently, then it, it's really not, an endeavor that we should be spending time on. That's where Anne or I could come in and support you with that and talk about ways that you can ask for that feedback in a way that aligns with your goals that you're looking for, ways that you're looking to improve the inclusivity of your courses, um, and in a way that's going to help you make all those things align together. So let's talk about some resources that you can use to improve universal design. So I'm going to show you a lot of things. These websites you can spend hours on each one of these websites and I'm gonna show you a few. So again, I uh, caution you to not be overwhelmed by all the information I'm showing you and just kind of think about one course in mind, maybe even one unit or module lesson within that course that you want to try to move that needle and improve the uh, universal design of that. This is probably my favorite website. And again, you can spend hours on that. Uh, UDL on campus, it's a subsection of the CAST organization. CAST is a really common website that gets shared when educators are talking about universal design because it's been around for decades. It's uh, thoroughly, um, it has great research behind it. I like how it's laid out, but I like UDL on campus even more and not everybody knows about UDL on campus. Uh, what I like is how they've divided the website into these three sections. So uh, course design, talking about how to plan your, your content and plan your instruction universally with the end goal in mind. Media and materials, I have found that particularly helpful as one of the courses I teach moved to completely asynchronous format. Um, and sometimes you struggle, I don't know if you agree with this, but sometimes I struggle with uh, making those lessons and that information come alive in an asynchronous format. So a lot of the suggestions involved there, I have incorporated and gotten some positive feedback from students. Um, and then there's accessibility and policy. So we're going to talk a little bit about some examples of those from my experience that I encourage you to take a look at or think about other ways that you could um, increase that universal design. So we've taught, we, we are mostly, uh, most of us have probably heard the term an accessible syllabus, but what does that really mean? Uh, it can be as simple as making sure that we uh, point students in the direction of all of the student supports that we have here. Again, I mentioned ETSU has done a phenomenal job with providing lots of different supports for students here on campus. Um, I really liked this phrase that I found on the UDL on campus website. Of course, we all include our compliant statements about students with documented disabilities connecting with us, talking to us about their accommodations. I like this one, though, because you might have students in your courses that don't necessarily have that documented formal disability, but they might need some support. So a, a student group I could think this applies to is maybe your um, career changer students who might be full-time um, employees elsewhere. They might have a family they're trying to juggle as well as taking uh, courses here at ETSU. So this is a student that needs a different kind of support or a different type of accommodation. Um, and putting a statement like this in your syllabus is just a great way to invite conversation with your students. 
it's a great way to um, let them know that you're there to listen to them and get to know them as a learner and, and build that relationship. Um, one of the uh, pieces of feedback I receive a lot from students is how important they think an organized D2L site is. Um, so I've heard from students saying they like it when instructors have certain aspects of their D2L site organized a certain way, or they feel really frustrated by those who don't have their D2L uh, site organized. One of the things that I have done specifically for my asynchronous course, but I would like to apply it to my face-to-face -face courses this fall, is created a video tour. I have used Panopto to do that, where I share my screen, I, I go into the student view, I share my screen and I click through certain links and show them where certain things are um, on the site. And they really, really appreciate that. I've had lots of students tell me in the asynchronous course, I went back to that video so many times so I could see where certain things are because they, they don't have um, the access to you in a face-to-face -face course that they might do to just ask you a really quick question. We know we have some students that are super emailers and will email you anything, but we also know we have some students that are a little bit more reserved and are afraid to ask certain questions or don't want to bother you by asking certain questions. No matter how many times you say, communicate, communicate, I'd love to help you, I'd love to ask or, or answer these questions for you, um, they still may not feel comfortable doing that. So this gives them a place to go and to have a resource to look at, but it also, again, communicates to them that you're interested in their learning, you're invested in their learning, and it might set the tone for them to be able to talk to you and communicate a little bit more. Um, and then we talk about multiple means of action and expression. So I have a really good example of this that comes from Access ETSU. Uh, so flexible pathways to learning is kind of the cornerstone with universal design. Like I said, it starts with the end goal in mind. What is it that I really need the student to be able to learn, to know, to understand, to um, demonstrate? And with one of our students that received services from us, uh, she was in a course that she was really interested in, very engaged in. And the capstone project in that course was a five to 10 page paper, uh, which writing just not her area of strength. And so with the uh, support of the academic coordinator at the time and the professor, they came up with a compromise and said, you know what, instead of writing, let's have her create an uh, a video that incorporated some interviews that she did. So she chose her topic, she conducted the same level of research as her peers. She came to the same level of conclusions as her peers. She had the same types of outcomes as her peers. She just did it in a different format. So instead of writing that paper, she was able to create a presentation and a video that expressed that she learned the exact same outcomes as her peers. This is a really great example, though it is kind of a big example of uh, being flexible with the expression and, and actions that students can take to show their learning. Um, if that's something that is a little kind of gives you pause, maybe a little bit scary, we can also talk to you about other ways to break that down into smaller pieces so that you can um, offer that flexibility for your students as well. We can uh, be flexible and provide accessibility through policies. So these are a couple of policies that I um, have revise over and over and over every semester it feels like I'm constantly revising because again I have that student that comes in and makes me go I never thought about it that way uh, so I mentioned the revise and resubmit policy so that is an example of where once the student has turned in their work I give them my feedback they have the option to resubmit it I kind I keep that time bound so that we're not resubmitting work at the end of the semester that they uh, had an opportunity to revise at the beginning. So I tell them they have a week once they receive the grade to take my feedback, use that to revise their work, and then I'll regrade that. Uh, the main reason that I do this is because, like many of us, I want the students to truly learn. I want them to understand the outcomes. I make a very bold statement to my, especially my undergraduates at the beginning of the semester and say, grades mean nothing to me. <laughs> because I'm really coming more from a standards-based and outcome-based evaluation process. Did you learn what you needed to learn? I did hesitate at first to incorporate this policy because I just thought certainly there's going to be people that uh, misuse it. And I thought, what if somebody gets maybe a 92% on a grade and they revise it and resubmit it because they really want that 100. And then again, I had to step back from that thought and I had to think, why? 
what would be so terrible and so wrong with somebody taking a 92 and trying to turn it into 100? Did they not improve their learning in some way? And that's when I realized that some students, they just need to know that that flexibility is a possibility. They need to know that that net is there so that they can take that leap, even if they don't use that net. Um, and most of my experience, I've had that, I've had that policy in effect every semester I've taught, every class I've taught, undergraduates, graduates, and I don't feel like any students have uh, misused that policy at all. Uh, so similarly, I also uh, have a flexible late work policy. I like the um, amnesty week bullet point here. That's something I came across while preparing for this session, and I think I'm going to try it this fall. Um, so amnesty week is adding a week into your semester where all right, if you have not turned something in, this is the week to do it, just like the, the week where you can turn in your books that are late at the library and not get any late fees. Um, so it's just showing a little bit of grace and forgiveness and flexibility with your students that um, maybe they have a really rough semester. Maybe they had something going on personally and they needed, um, they got really overwhelmed or got really far behind. Again, this really communicates that you're, to your students even if they don't use that policy, even if they're that A student that's always on top of things, they turn things in two weeks early, they're never going to use this amnesty week policy. Um, it communicates to them that I care about your learning and I'm invested in, in what you have to do. I do incorporate the second bullet for, point under late work where I have flexibility built into the assignment requirements. So for example, if I require students to participate in six discussion posts, um, maybe choosing four that are graded or allowing them to drop a certain number of uh, low grades. I think that's a pretty common policy that you might already be implementing. And believe it or not, it's, it's an example of universal design. So really, you're probably doing more of this than you realized at the beginning. Um, so that is one that I have found is really successful because I tie that into attendance. I want students to come to class, to be engaged, being ready to learn, all of that. But I struggle with just that kind of ambiguous, vague, okay, show up and, and you earn five points because you could show up and put your head down on the desk and be checked out and you're earning points for that. And I'd rather know what, what do you know about this topic? So I start um, my weekly classes, the ones that meet once a week with an entrance ticket where I ask them to fill out or answer some questions about the content uh, that we're going to go over. With that, I tell them, uh, there's no right or wrong answer. Try to leave things very open ended so that I can get some um, really good information about how they prepared for this class. Not only does that give me a quick and easy way to look at attendance and see who was here, who was involved, it uh, gives me really good information about what they are ready to learn in class that day. Uh, with that entrance ticket, I include just an open ended check in like, how are you today? So Thinking back to the slide that had all the cats on it, sometimes I might put up something like that and say, you know, using this cat scale, I want you to tell me how you're feeling today or how your week has been going or what are your thoughts about the semester. So I always include one question on that entrance ticket that has nothing to do with the content we're covering, just as a way that I can um, check in with my students. I learn a lot about my students that way a lot. Um, so I have a lot of questions that I choose from. So if you need a list of those, feel free to send me an email and I can send you some ideas. Um, and then just looking at your attendance policy and looking at why do we have things set up the way that we have, have them set up and is it working? Sometimes some of the things we do, we have them set up that way and they're not really working for us or the students. So let's talk about that and let's see what we can do to move that needle with them. All right, so this is one of the final resources I'm going to share with you. This is a screenshot from the TIES Center that provides a lot of inclusive uh, UDL resources. The entire website is generally geared towards uh, K-12 learning, but it's still super applicable to what we do here. You On the next screen, I'll show you some examples of where you can kind of sort through and see what you can apply to your setting and um, what, what might be the best step for you. So looking at uh, these three uh, categories, so student engagement, student understanding, and student participation, there's a lot of options within there. And this is just a small example, a lot of options in there about, hmm, how can I spark student understanding and maybe offer multiple ways uh, that students can take this information in? So these are all clickable links on the website. So if I were to have clicked that first link underneath student engagement, 
I come to a um, list of strategies such as this one. Uh, so for example, the first one just talks about offering information in more than one way. So like I mentioned earlier, let's say you have a student read cha a chapter in the text and when you're lecturing, you're including a visual, maybe a graphic organizer, and you're also explaining it verbally. That's three modalities right there that you're giving a student to be able to take in that information. Some of those are going to resonate better than um, others with different types of students. I'm more of the visual person. I like to look at the visual. I like to read the text. Um, and I'm less of a talking, listening person, which is ironic because I'm talking to you now. But um, I try to also apply that to a lot of um, the visuals that I also pre present in class too. And as you can see, even within that list, there's even more hyperlinks with even more resources. When I tell you, you could be on these UDL websites for hours, I mean hours. So don't let it overwhelm you. We're going to choose little pieces at a time to implement so we can move that needle towards inclusivity. Um, so before I turn it over to Anne, this is the last um, strategy I want to talk about. This is a strategy that blew my mind when I implemented it. Um, so I really, uh, I learned a lot from implementing this strategy. What you're looking at is called a unit organizer. And the Kansas, uh, University of Kansas offers a um, uh, training that you could take, but you can also probably use it uh, to improve your learning or your students' learning and improve your instruction. Um, that's what I did. I took each of these and I mapped out some of the uh, courses that I teach onto each of these. So what you're looking at, and I know it's probably somewhat hard to see because the text is small, um, and I uh, was able to find this, in this example online. So this is Causes of the Civil War is the name of the unit. Within the middle here, where you have all those concept maps, that those little bubbles, they have the topics, and that helps connect all of the different uh, pieces of information related to that topic together. Uh, there's also another side of this unit organizer where underneath each of those um, smaller bubbles, they might have a list of important vocabulary, might have a list of important concepts that relate to each one of those. What this helps me do as an instructor is organize my content to make sure that there's a flow, that it makes sense, it's all connecting, and it helps students, particularly those who might have some um, neurodiversity that need that support with scaffolding, scaffolding, they need that help connecting and seeing kind of the big picture of things. But you could also think about different student and student groups that this would also apply to and support them as well. Um, this is also super, super helpful for those of us who just want to make sure that we're aligning our instruction again with the end goal. It's, it's incredibly helpful. Down here at the bottom, and again, I know it's really hard to see, but on the bottom left, the longer rectangle side, it has self-test questions. So if you provide those to the students and tell them, hey, you should be able to answer these questions at the end of this module. And if you can, then your learning is on target or it's on track, it's right on target. If not, let's go back and revisit some of these concepts. Um, and then in the right side, it's really, really small is a list of academic terms. So um, students can understand that they should be able to compare and contrast or be able to describe or see causes and effects. So this is something that when I used it and reorganized the course that I teach in the fall, I was really amazed. I thought my course was really well organized, really efficient, because like I said, I had revamped it over and over and over again. And then I mapped all of my content onto these organizers and I was blown away by how much better it, was, it, it got. So if you have questions about this, I'd love to work on um, this with you and talk to you about this. So... Lastly, I'm going to let Ann talk to you for about two or so minutes about all the ways that we can support you at Access ETSU, regardless of whether or not you have a student in any of your courses that get services from us. Uh, we have a responsibility to the entire campus to provide you with tools to build your capacity to make your courses more inclusive and work on that universal design with you. So I'll let Ann talk to you about some um, services we can offer you. Hey, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Dr. Levin. So as you can see, we'll just start at the top and, and go around. So for some of the things that access ETSU that we can support you with, um, assessment redesign, we can look at your unit assessments together with a UDL lens, and we can find ways to make them more inclusive and accessible. So for example, if 
many of your assessments might be multiple choice, for example, um, and you want to offer more opportunities for students to demonstrate their knowledge in different ways. We can talk about options for evaluating the same information um, among your students just in different ways. Um, and then increase in choice making. And I know Dr. Blevins mentioned this earlier about how an increase in choice making um, just actually increases ownership among students um, and also there increases their accountability and engagement. Um, so we can also review your course together and find ways to incorporate and increase um, ways that they can make choices in your course. Um, syllabus review, um, we can look at examples of inclusive and accessible syllabi and talk about elements that you may want to include in yours. This is actually a great place to begin when incorporating UDL in your practice. Like we have just found that a really strong syllabus will just help clarify expectations and really support students in their learning. It's like it's just a great place to start if you're looking for like where you might want to start this process. And then finally, like customized PD. If you have something in mind that you'd like to discuss, I know she has given you a lot of food for thought today. Um, and you like something you want to discuss and just want more support with, we can talk to you about ways to just work together and to move the needle toward more inclusive, toward a more inclusive course. So you feel free to reach out to me or Dr. Blevins and we can um, get together and discuss further. All right, thank you. So let's summarize uh, what we've talked about today. Again, I could talk about all of these things for 45 minutes or more each. Um, so this is just your overview highlight. So universal design, we're starting with the end goal in mind to make learning as accessible as possible with a lot of different ways, flexible pathways to learning. Um, getting started, if, if that's the, the path that you're on, I want you to start small. So think about one course that you want to make more accessible, or maybe even one lesson within a course, one learning outcome. Just choose one and go from there. I also want you to think about ways you're already making things accessible for students, because you definitely are. Um, and I also want you to think about what makes sense for you and your content. So uh, if you have a course that has a required assignment, that has to that has to stay a certain way um, in order for you know for accreditation purposes. I would recommend don't start with that assignment. So let's talk about a different way that might make sense, more sense for you to get started. Um, but regardless of where you are, again, I believe that each one of you are already doing things to make your courses, your practices more accessible. They're already universally designed. And let's think about ways that you can um, move that needle, whether it's next semester or future semesters. Um, so we are here for a few more minutes to answer any questions you might have. I've been keeping an eye on the chat. I don't see any right now. Um, and please do not hesitate to contact us. That is what we're here for. This is my information. Um, Anne is on our website, or you can send me an email and I can get it to her. So thank you all so much. Does anybody have any questions? See some head shakes? No, so that's good. And I don't see anything in the chat. So, oh, all right. All right, so thank you all so much. Again, um, we are here to help you. So please reach out to us, anything that we can do um, to connect. We'd love to connect. And we, we like meeting lots of new friends on yeah. campus. We've met a lot. <laughs> so please don't hesitate. Anne and Melanie, thank you all so much um, for the for the presentation. It's definitely in line with some of what we're trying to go with equity and inclusion at institutions. So again, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. This was great. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Thank thank Chastity for inviting you. So this this is good. Yes, yes, we appreciate that, Chastity. Okay. All right. Remember, everyone is participating. You should have gotten a. Um, a note in the chat regarding the assessment. So we would love to hear your feedback uh, for the presentation. Uh, so again, thank you all and, and have a great, great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye.